most people will recognize as absurd, all the whining by election deniers, COVID deniers, white supremacists, and neo-Nazis that they somehow have a God-given right to spout off on other people's private internet platforms. Give me a break. If you don't like rules against public health disinformation or racist incitement, then go set up your own social media platform. Most of us don't want to live in a world where our government withholds critical factual information from social media entities and then right-wing politicians heckle and harass them to force them to host election deniers, Holocaust deniers, COVID-19 deniers, racist anti-Semites, and so on. Compelling social media to carry the propaganda of big liars cannot be the meaning of free speech in the 21st century. You know, there's something a bit presumptuous about legislation called the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act, because that, of course, is the whole purpose and meaning of the First Amendment, which protects all private speech against government interference, censorship, and punishment. If our prideful ambition today is to improve upon the framer's handiwork crafting the First Amendment, we must be very careful to address actual real problems without creating numerous new problems and threats to free speech, democracy, and public safety along the way. Legislation should address real problems. The original flaw of this legislation is that it's based on the entirely false premise that government officials pressured or coerced Twitter to suppress the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop, laptop for all of 24 hours. At our last hearing, none of the three witnesses called by the GOP majority supported that theory in any way. In fact, the hearing ended with the conclusion on February 8th that there was no governmental pressure or coercion involved in the private company's fleeting independent decision to moderate access to the Hunter Biden laptop story for a day or two. Yet after having failed to identify any government action in this sequence of events, the legislation conveniently moves to redefine censorship from meaning government suppression of private speech to meaning private entities regulating their own speech content and speech platforms. This move is radical indeed. We usually do not say that newspapers and TV networks censor themselves when they decide to put one thing on the air instead of another. Indeed, even with the recent shocking disclosure of internal conversations showing that Fox News anchors like Tucker Carlson completely knew that Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump were lying about their ridiculous 2020 election claims and called them behind the scenes insane, absurd, shockingly reckless, in dangerous hell, but then credited those claims on air, nonetheless, it would still be strange to say that Fox News was censoring itself. Yet the whole purpose and design of the legislation is to protect private speakers from being censored by private media entities because of prior communications they may have had with the government or information they may have received from the government. But the receipt or collection of information from the government does not transform a private entity's editorial decisions into state action from the standpoint of the First Amendment. For example, if a newspaper is set to run an op-ed saying that the COVID vaccine is more dangerous to the public than COVID, for example, but then the CDC sends out a report completely debunking that claim, and so the editors decide not to run the op-ed, that's a private editorial decision entirely protected by the First Amendment. The disappointed op-ed writer has no First Amendment cause of action against the CDC or against the newspaper. Social media companies have a First Amendment right to establish their own rules governing their own speech, including false speech and speech inciting violence and race hate. Social media companies also have a right to use threat information shared by the government to enforce their rules and make private business decisions. But H.R. 140 <clears throat> now threatens the ability of law enforcement and other government agencies to share information that these companies want to get, such as information warning them of violence inciting and violence planning speech on their platforms that poses a serious threat to public safety and democratic institutions. H.R. 140 would work as a Putin 
Protection Act, given his demonstrated propensity for spending tens of millions of dollars on his internet research agency to pump propaganda and fake news directly into the bloodstream of American political campaigns. This is a serious danger created by this legislation, given the escalating global campaign by autocrats, theocrats, and communist bureaucrats to inject chaos and division in democratic societies. This bill seeks to solve what we already established in our hearings was not a problem at all, but because of its selective nature, it would create numerous serious problems going forward for American democracy while still allowing politicians to threaten private media entities over their content and editorial decisions. And we will have more to say about how much of that is really going on. I respect, respectfully urge the committee to reject H.R. 140, and I yield back.